Stanford University. All right, well, welcome to lecture number seven of CS193P, spring of 2016. So we got a lot of different topics today, a couple of demos interspersed with it. Um, here are all the topics. A lot of these are kind of, I don't want to say advanced SWIFT features, but kind of important SWIFT features that we haven't talked about uh, so far. And then towards the end, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, an iOS kind of concept that comes over from the Objective-C world that we have to deal with in Swift called delegation, but it's super important. Uh, has to do with our whole MVC model and how we do that blind structured communication. And then I'm gonna finish off with scroll view. Okay, very important class because these devices are really small and you wanna look at something big until you need to be able to scroll and zoom uh, in on it. Okay, all right. First topic, memory management. So I told you already that reference classes, reference types, which are classes, live in the heap, right? And that that memory is automatically taken care of for you, okay? That's called automatic reference counting because it's a reference counting based scheme. It keeps track of how many pointers are pointing to something and when that count goes to zero, it immediately frees it. Right, which is different from like garbage collection where you're basically going through the heap and marking it, trying, trying to find things that aren't pointed to and then sweeping through, um, uh, marking and sweeping and then clearing out. And so, you know, that kind of memory freeing is, can be intermittent and it's not really predictable, whereas ARC is completely and utterly predict predictable. Normally you don't think about ARC, you don't think about memory in the heap at all, except for there are, there is a small way that you can influence ARC the way it works. And that's what these three things right here, strong, weak, and unowned. Okay, so we're gonna talk about each of these three um, keywords that you can put in Swift. And all of them you use when you're declaring a, variab a variable. Okay, it's all for declaring variables. All right, so strong, you don't even see the word strong in Swift because that's the default. Uh, strong is normal reference counting. Basically, a pointer that is strong forces whatever's in the heap to stay in the heap until that pointer no longer points to it, okay? So it strongly holds things in the, in the heap. So that's the default, okay? As you go around creating pointers, they all are strong pointers. You gotta get rid of all the pointers to something for it to clean up, okay? But then there's weak. So if you have a weak pointer, it means if no one else is interested in this thing in the heap, then you can get rid of it in the heap and set me to nil, okay? So it's kind of like, yeah, I'm pointing the thing in the heap, but I'm not that interested in it. If it goes away, then just set me to nil. Now, for me to be set to nil, that means I have to be an optional pointer, okay? So weak only works for optional reference pointers, okay? So basically optional pointers to classes, all right? Um, a weak pointer never keeps things in the heap, okay? It's up to strong pointers pointing to things to keep them in the heap. Um, so a good example of this that you've already seen is outlets, right? Remember your calculator, you have an outlet to the display, that UI label, that's weak, okay? It automatically got set to be weak. Why is that weak? Well, because the view hierarchy, okay? The super view, for example, of that UI label, it has a strong pointer to that UI label. So your outlet doesn't have to keep it in the, keep, in the heap because it's going to be kept in the heap by the view hierarchy. But if the view hierarchy ever gets rid of that UI label, in other words, it's no longer part of the view, then you're probably not interested in it as an outlet anyway. So just set the outlet to nil. Now, you notice when you make an outlet, you can, at the bottom, switch over to strong, meaning that even if the UI label comes out of the view hierarchy, it'll still stay in the heap. Okay, maybe you want to do that because maybe you want to put it back in the view hierarchy after it got removed from the view hierarchy. Okay, that'd be one of the only reasons I can think of that you would have a strong pointer through an outlet to something in the view, in the view hierarchy, right? Because maybe you're going to take it in and out. Okay, everyone understand weak? Optional reference pointers can be weak. Okay, you just declare it when you say var, you say weak var whatever optional pointer. Okay, and then the last one here, unowned. Unowned kind of means don't reference count this, which is very dangerous. Uh, it's, you have, if you have an unowned pointer, it means that uh, reference counting is not going to track it. And so this pointer is always going to point to that little place in memory. And you better be sure that there, the thing you point to stays there, okay, until you don't use that, this pointer anymore. 
okay? And if you have an unknown pointer and you later reference it and the thing that you're referencing got thrown out of the heap because there were no more strong pointers to it, then you will crash, okay? Which is basically memory reference error. Now, you might say, why do I ever want this unknown thing? And uh, I will show you a little example later in this lecture of a way to break a memory cycle between objects. One object points to another, which points back to the first one directly or indirectly, keeping them both in memory. Uh, you can break it with unknown, but oftentimes you'll break it with weak, but you'll see that coming up. Okay? So this is the only way you can influence arc is with these three things. And you almost never really use this. It's very rare to use these. Weak, mm, occasionally. Strong, never because it's the default. And unowned, next to never. Okay? All right, let's talk more about closures. We did closures in our first lecture, first week of lectures. Remember, we had those closures like $0 times $1. That's a closure. A closure is just an inline function. And uh, one thing that's interesting about closures, they're stored in the heap as well. Okay? So closures are essentially a reference type. Okay? Because remember, the closures are just functions. Functions are types, they're just normal types in Swift. Um, so uh, they're stored in the heap. Now that has interesting ramifications for the way things work because inside of a closure, you can reference all kinds of variables that were in the scope around it, okay? Because remember, it's an inline function, so you might reference variables that are local variables in that inline function, in the function you're in, or it might be instance variable, properties of the class. If you're inside a method when you declare the closure, it's perfectly legal to, to access all of those things. And not only to access them, but you can access them read-write. Okay, well now we know from the calculator that sometimes a closure lives a long time. Maybe it gets put in a dictionary like we did in the calculator, right? And so that dictionary can live for a long, long time. And that closure keeps getting pulled out and called. Called. So what happens if you put a local variable, you captured a local variable in one of these closures and you put it in there? Well, that local variable has to be kept around too. And Swift automatically does this, okay? Anything that gets captured inside a closure, that you use inside a closure, gets moved, or if it already is in the heap, it gets a strong pointer to it from the closure. Otherwise, it gets moved to the heap. Okay, so everything gets in the, stays in the heap. Okay, everything with a closure and everything it references internally in its implementation, all of that gets in the heap. Okay, so what is the problem with that? Well, there's no problem. It generally just kind of works how you would think, except for memory cycles. Okay, so let's go through why a memory cycle can be created and what's bad about memory cycles. Okay, what's bad about them is you have a closure pointing to an object. That object is pointing back to the closure. They're pointing to each other. They have strong references to each other. How can they ever leave the heap? Never, right? Because they each are pointing to each other. They always are going to maintain a strong pointer to each other. There's no way, unless you set one of those pointers to nil, okay, or something else, there's no way they can stop pointing to each other. Okay, so let's see how this can happen with the calculator. Let's say in my calculator brain I added uh, a new method called add unary function that took a symbol and an operation, right? A uh, function that takes a double, returns a double. And basically I'm making it so that the user of my calculator brain can add their own functions. Right now our calculator brain just has this built-in table of functions and operations. Well, what if I added this method and I just let people add them? That would be really cool, right? And so let's say we have our view controller and we wanted to add a unary function which is the same as square root except for that it would turn the display in the calculator red, okay? So I call it red square root, okay? It's just square root, but it's gonna turn the, the thing red when the result comes back. Well, how would we do that? Okay, well, we would just call this add unary operation. Now, uh, one thing I just wanna remind you a little bit about the syntax here. You see here's unary operation has two arguments. There's the symbol, okay? Here's the operation, which is this closure. Of course, uh, because of type inference, I don't, well, first of all, I don't need to do this comma second, uh, uh, second argument here. I can actually put this closure after the end, right? So I can take this second argument and put it after the end. Remember, that's the trailing closure syntax. Everyone remember this? Okay, since the closure is the last argument, we can do this. Uh, also, I don't need any of this type stuff in here because it can infer that. Okay, so I can just take that away and use dollar zero down here. Okay, everyone remember that? All right, so here I am adding this unary operation. Notice that it sets the display color. This is in my view controller, my calculator view controller, right? It sets the display color to red when it does the square root. Okay, this is gonna be a unary operation. Everyone understand what this is doing? 
Really super simple. Okay, well this code will not compile. Okay, why will this code not compile? It's interesting. It's because, and when you look at the warning, it's gonna say, you have to put self dot in front of this, which normally you don't have to do. You can just reference your own properties with display. Why do you have to put self dot? Well, you have to put self dot there because the compiler wants you to realize that this closure is going to capture this self and keep a strong pointer to it forever, for as long as this closure lives. Okay, and this closure is going to be put in a dictionary in another class, so it's going to live a long time. Uh, it's going to capture self. So self now has a strong pointer to it. It can never leave the heap until this closure leaves the heap. Okay? But this closure is never going to leave the heap because it's in the calculator brain, which the view controller has a strong pointer to. So who leaves the heap first? Neither of them. Okay, so they're stuck. Um, so that's why Swift forces you to put that there so you realize that you are implicitly capturing and, and making a strong point or two self. <coughs> All right, now how do we deal with this? How do we break this loop so that we can have these things leave the heap normally, okay? Um, there's a couple ways we can do it. First, we have to realize that there's a cool syntax in Swift that allows you to declare variables to use inside your closure right at the beginning. And all you do is a square brackets here, and then you just put the names of the variables you want and their initial values, okay? You can put it right in here. For example, I can create a variable called me, M-E, and I'm gonna set it to self, okay? And so me is now a local variable only inside this closure, and its value is self, okay? And sure enough, look, I can change self right there to be me, because me is just a local variable. But this would have no effect on the, uh, the closure problem because me is still self and it's still gonna make a strong pointer uh, to self and hold it in memory. But I can use those, uno those unowned weak and strong things with this variable. So I'm gonna say unowned me equals self. Now we've broken that cycle, okay? Because unowned means don't reference count this, which means that Swift is not going to make a strong pointer to this me in this closure. So now the closure does not point strongly to self. Self still points strongly to this closure through the calculator brain, through the dictionary to it, okay? But it does not now strongly point back. So it's not gonna keep the view controller in memory. Now, the danger here is if this closure lived longer than the view controller lived, which is pretty much impossible because this is in a dictionary that's in the brain that the controller owns, but if some wackiness happened and this lived longer and we tried to execute this closure after the view controller is gone, this will crash, okay? Because me would be pointing to something that got free from the heat. But another way to do it besides unowned is weak. So we could make self weak, okay? This will work great. This will also break the cycle because weak things don't keep things in the heap. However, self inside this closure now becomes what? An optional. UI view controller, okay? So this self right here, this local variable self has the same name, but it's a different variable than the outer self, okay? And this is weak, so this will not work anymore. This won't compile because display is not a message you can send to an optional. You can only send it to our view controller, our calculator view controller. So how do you fix this? Well, the simplest way is to use this optional chaining. And just put a question mark in here. Remember, if you put a question mark on an optional on the left-hand side of an equal sign, it means if any of these things with a question mark are nil, just ignore this whole line. Okay, bail out. So this is perfect. Weak self, if this self ever were nil, this would just bail out and not do it. Okay, so now this code would work even if the view controller got thrown out of the heap. And since this is weak, we're using a weak self in here, it won't keep the, the view controller in the heap. Now, when we do this weak self, here we almost always declare a different name here. Almost always weak self, okay? So weak variable weak self equals self, and then we'll put that in there. And that tells people reading our code, yeah, I understand I'm making this weak, so don't worry about that, that possible memory cycle. Okay? So that's closures and memory cycles. I'm gonna do a demo on this, okay? Which is, I'm gonna do that red square root, and let's see what this looks like in the calculator to do this. All right, so I'm going back to our calculator. That's that, there we go. Okay, so here's our calculator as we left it off. This is not your homework calculator, this is lecture four or whatever our last time. We just have this, uh, 
uh, blank calculator right here. I'm going to, now that you're comfortable with things like navigation controllers, I'm going to actually add another view controller here, okay? And I'm going to put a button in it. Oops, make this bigger. Put a button in this. I'm going to make it bigger. We'll make it uh, 40 point, let's say. Okay, I'm going to change the title to be calculate. Okay, and this button is going to cause this calculator here to appear. So let's go ahead and reset to suggested constraints. Notice when I did that, oh look, I got all kinds of constraints I didn't really want. You see, because that's because I didn't have this thing being its natural size. So let's go over to the size inspector over here and look at our constraints. And we see, oh, it's constraining the width to be 204. I don't want that. I want it to be its natural width. So I'm just going to select this constraint, constraint and hit delete. Same thing here. It's constraining it to the top by some magic number 203. I don't want that because I want it to be aligned center X and Y. So it's okay in here just to go and delete constraints you don't work, want. Now, of course, now this is yellow. So we're going to go down here and say, click on this, sorry, and go down here and say, update frames. And that's going to move the frames to wherever they should be. And now everything is good. Okay, a little quick review there of constraints. Um, also, I don't want the entry point to be my calculator. I want it to be this thing. Okay, this is going to be my first thing. And I'm going to put it inside of a navigation controller. So I'm going to put this inside a navigation controller with embed in. Oops, can okay, select this again. Embed in navigation controller. And now I have a nice little UI here that has a navigation controller in this. And I'm going to make it so that this button, when it's clicked, segues to show a calculator. Okay, so let's do that. Control drag over here. We're going to do a show because we're inside a navigation controller. Not, this is not for iPad, this is iPhone only. So I'm just going to do show. And here's our show. Now, I'm not going to set an identifier here because I'm not going to prepare that calculator. I'm just going to let it come up in whatever its state is. I'm not going to prepare it. So no need to put an identifier here. Okay, so this is what our UI looks like. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. See what this looks like. Okay, so here's our calculator. We're inside a navigation controller. Hit calculate, it shows it. Go back, hit calculate, it shows it. Now remember, in a navigation controller, every time we segue, what happens? We get a new MVC. So we're getting a new calculator MVC every single time. And in fact, I'm going to prove that to you by going back here to my calculator view controller. And I'm going to have it print every time it creates a new one and every time it leaves the heap. Okay? So let's start with every time it creates a new one. We can use view did load for that. Okay? So here's view did load. Remember, in our view controller life cycles, we always need to call super. Okay, so I'm calling super view did load. I'm going to create a global variable here, which is my calculator count. Start out at zero. That's how many calculator instances are currently existing in the world. So when I do a view did load, which we know only happens once per MVC, I'm going to take my calculator count and increment it by one. And then I'm just going to print out loaded up a new calculator. And I'll tell you what the count is at that time. And that's going to be calculator count. Okay, so every time we create a new MVC, we're just going to get a message. Now, how do we find out when something leaves the heap? Anyone do the homework, the reading homework and tell me? Special method, what? Nobody? Oh my gosh, okay, D init. Okay, this special thing D init gets called just before you leave the heap. Okay, so in here, I'm just going to say the calculator count minus equals one, because this is leaving the heap. And I'm going to do a print here. I'm going to say calculator left the heap. And now show our count. OK, so now when I run, we're going to see our count of calculators and what happens to it as we keep clicking that calculator button and keep having new MVCs, all right? So here we go. Let's calculate. There it is. Loaded up a new calculator. Count equals one. Looks good. We go back. Calculator left the heap. Count is zero. Go back again, note it up a new calculator, count is one. Go back, count is zero. So this is proving what I was saying before, that every time we segue, it's creating a new one, and every time we go back, it throws it out. Everybody 
Believe that now? Okay. So now let's go ahead and do our red uh, square root. Okay, let's do our red square root button. I told you I was going to go to calculator brain, brain and add a new public function here called add unary operation. It's going to take a symbol, which is a string, and it's going to take an operation that goes along with it, which takes a double and returns a double. Okay, and adding a unary operation is really easy because all we have to do is add a unary operation to this table right here. Okay, so I'm just going to say operation some symbol. Okay, this is the symbol that the person is, wants this under. We're going to set this equal to the operation. We can't really do that though because we have enums in here. So we need to wrap a operation.unary operation around this thing. Okay, and the associated value is a double takes a double, so that works. And that's it. So I just added a unary operation to my operations table. Okay, now that we have that feature, Okay, let's go back to our view controller and use it. In my view did load right here, uh, I'm going to add a unary operation. Oops, add. In my brain, I'm going to add a unary operation. And I'm going to say, I'm going to have its symbol be the letter Z, but we could make it a nice red dot in a square root sign, but faster to type Z. And uh, the function is going to be a closure. Okay, and again, I can use the trailing closure notation to do that right here. Okay, and as we said in the slides, I'm just going to set my displays uh, text color equal to UI color red color, and then I'm going to return the square root of dollar zero. Okay, and as promised, I have an error right here. It says reference to property display enclosure requires explicit self to make capture semantics explicit. Okay, hopefully that, well, that warning makes perfect sense now. It makes, wants you to be clear that you are going to capture self. It's going to get a strong pointer to it. So I'm going to do the fix it right here, which is insert self. Fixes that problem. And now we have unary operation. So let's go to our storyboard and add that somewhere here. We'll replace, how about we replace our old square root with our new z square root. And run. All right, so here we are. Okay, I'm going to hit calculate, load it up a new calculator. Let's do 81 red square root. It's working perfectly. Okay, it took the square root and it turned the display red. And so let's go back. Uh oh, we didn't, lose, didn't leave the heap. That's weird. Let's go back again. Oh, now we have two calculators. Oh, uh, what's going on? Three. Oh, no, we're collecting calculators. Now, these calculators are not very big, they don't have a lot of storage, so probably not going to kill us, but what if these had an image, right? Or even like a video or something in there, and we we're collecting these things, and they were building up in the heap, never to be freed. Okay, that would be a problem. Okay, so how can we make it so that it goes back to the way it was, where when we left, it would free up? Well, all we got to do is go here to this and fix the problem that this self is being held in memory so that a view controller can't be freed when it comes off. Okay, so we can do exactly what we talked about before. We can create, for example, unowned me equals self. How about that one? Okay, don't forget the in right here. Okay, all this stuff has to go before the in, all right, the closure in. Uh, so if we do that, and now we say me, okay, so me right here is unowned, so it's not going to keep anything in the heap. All right, and we know it's safe here because we're the view controller. We own the brain, so there's no way that we're going to get thrown out before the brain. So let's run again. So here's calculate, 81 square root. Okay, red is still working. Back, left the heap. Okay, working good, see that? All right, now another way we could have done it here instead of unowned is we could have said weak, weak self equals self. Okay, so this is a weak variable right here. It's a, going to be an optional. In fact, if I look at it, see, it's an optional view controller. You see that? Optional view controller. So right here, it's complaining. You can't send display to, oops, this, this was weak self. It would be complaining. You can't send display to weak self because it's an optional. See? And it's asking, do you want to put exclamation point? But I'm going to be more conservative and just put a question mark right here, just in case this ever did get to be nil. I just want this line of code not to happen. Okay, so let's see if that fixes our problem. Uh, 
All right, calculate, back, calculate, back, calculate, and square root, still turning it red. Okay, now you're probably gonna be using functions, I would imagine, in your assignment three, and closures too, probably. I'm not going to require that you not have memory loops. In other words, you're allowed to have these memory cycles in your assignment three. Uh, but if you want to try and fix it in your assignment three, you're welcome to. Okay? So I never ask you to do anything in your assignment that I didn't teach you in class before I gave you the assignment. So this is after I gave you the assignment. So it's totally optional uh, if you want to fix it. Uh, but otherwise, it's likely you probably will have a memory cycle in your assignment three. It's, it's possible you won't, but likely you would if you don't do this. Okay? Any question about that? All right, back to our slides. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is a cool little Swift feature called extensions, okay? Extensions allow you to add methods and properties to other classes, even if you don't have the source code to those other classes. So, for example, you can add it to classes in UIKit, okay? You could add a method to UI button. Or in this case, I've added a method to UI view controller. Okay? So when I add this method, it's available all throughout my app. All view controllers will now have this method. Okay? Now, what is this example, this method I did right here? Well, remember when we're doing prepare for segue and we want to handle the case where we put the detail of the split view controller into a navigation controller? And so when the segue happens, we have to look inside the navigation controller. Remember that? And we had this little code right here, if let navcon equal uh, the destination view controller as navigation controller, then return the visible view controller. Remember all that business? Well, I'm just going to add that inside of a method here in view controller called content view controller. So if I ask a view controller, what's your content view controller? Well, if it's a navigation controller, it's going to give me the visible view controller. Okay? If it's any other view controller, it's just going to give me itself, because itself is the content. That way, whether it's in a view navigation controller or not, I'm going to get the thing that I intend, the content that I'm trying to get at. Okay, everyone understand that? So that makes your prepare for segue, instead of looking like this, where you got this destination and all oh, this, you can actually make this into a one-liner. We can get rid of all of this and make one-liner. So let's see if we can understand this. Ready? Here we go. We're going to say the segue's destination view controller, its content view controller, as my view controller. If I can do that, then I'm good to go. See? So see how this simplified this code really nicely? Now, extensions, got to be a little careful with. They can be abused, OK? You start adding all these wacky methods to classes where it makes no sense, OK? You're still object-oriented programmers. If you're going to add a method to UI view controller, it better make sense as a UI view controller method, OK? It shouldn't be some calculator method, OK? This has nothing to do with calculators. It has everything to do with UI view controllers. Okay, so if you use extensions, use them wisely. Use them in an object-oriented fashion. Okay, now um, inside of an extension, notice that you're going to refer to self. Self, of course, means the UI view controller you sent this to. Just like self would mean if you had a method uh, in UI view controller that was in that class. Okay. Um, a couple of interesting restrictions on, on uh, extensions. Uh, oh, by the way, you can extend classes, structs, and enums. Okay, all of them are extensible. You can't re-implement any methods or properties. It's not a re-implement thing. Okay, it's an additional thing. You can add methods, but you can't re-implement. Okay. Also, any properties that you add have to be computed properties, like that content view controller was. You can't have any storage with your extension. Okay, extension is purely for adding code, no storage. All right. Um, this feature, as I said, is easily abused because you can add all kinds of non-object-oriented methods and stuff like that. But actually, this feature can be really powerful for organizing and structuring your code. Okay? And it's really beyond the scope for this class for me to show you how you could use extensions in terms of building uh, your kind of code infrastructure in your app. But know that it's possible. Because if you go out there in the real world and you start building big apps, uh, extensions are a great way to kind of divide up big, complicated classes uh, into uh, sensible sub-pieces that are each extensions. Also, if you have protocols, which I'm going to talk about later in this lecture, extensions are a great way to implement a protocol in a class. So well, you'll see what that means uh, in a minute. 
Okay? For now, you can use extensions in your homework or whatever, but use it more along the lines of the content view controller example, right? Small utility functions that make sense, that kind of thing, okay? Maybe for your final project, if you want to read up on how you can use extensions to build your code base, uh, you can try it then. But on your homework assignments, let's stick to the little stuff, okay? All right, so I mentioned protocols. Let's talk about protocols. Protocols are a way to, an exp to express an API more concisely, okay? Protocols are another type. They're the last type I'm going to talk about, okay? We've talked about classes, enums, structs. Now we're going to talk about protocols and functions. Those are also type. Now we're going to talk about protocols, okay? The last type, okay? So what a protocol does is it lets you have an API where instead of having to specify the full class or struct that you're going to be using to do whatever you're going to do, you can just specify what it is about that class or struct that you actually need. Okay? And you do this with a protocol, and a protocol is simply a collection of method and property declarations. Okay? So it's just like a little bundle of methods, and you can have part of your API that says, I want something that implements this bundle of methods. And it can be any kind of struct, enum, class, whatever, as long as you implement those little methods. Okay? And that's what a protocol is all about. So um, it's a type. Anywhere you can use a type, you can use a protocol. So any, like I might have an argument to a function that takes a UI view controller. It could also take a protocol okay, that has a few methods in UI view controller that I needed. So then it wouldn't be so restrictive and have to be a, a UI view controller. It could just be something that implements those methods. Okay? Anywhere you can use a type, you can use a protocol. Okay? The implementation of a protocol happens in the class that implements the protocol, the class or method or class or struct or enum that implements the protocol. Okay? The protocol itself doesn't have any implementation. The protocol itself is just a declaration of the properties and methods. Okay? Now, it is possible, however, to use extensions to implement some or all of a protocol. So you just say extension protocol, instead of saying extension class name, whatever, you say extension protocol, open curly brace, and implement some of the methods or properties in the protocol. Okay? Now, protocols, just like extensions, can have no storage. Okay? Protocol can have no storage, and extensions can have no storage either, so there's no way to implement some of the protocol with any storage. No VARs, okay? You can have VARs, but they have to be computed. Okay, so no, pro no storage in protocols or extensions. All right, so there's four aspects to using a protocol. One is the protocol declaration. That's where you declare what methods and properties are in this protocol. Then there's the declaration where a class, a struct, or an enum says, I implement this protocol. So it's not good enough if you're a class or a struct enum to just implement the methods or the properties in there. You have to actually declare, I implement this. Then you have to go implement all the methods and, and uh, properties as well. Okay, and we'll show you how to do that. Then there's the code that implements the protocol, and that's usually going to be uh, in the class struct or enum that said it was going to implement it, but it could also be in an extension. Okay, it could either be an extension to the protocol or it could be an extension to the class struct or enum. Okay, you could have implementation in there. Again, no storage though. So if you need storage to implement it, that's going to have to be inside the class struct or enum. All right, optional methods in a protocol. This one's a little bit tricky. Okay, in Swift, protocols, all the properties, all the methods are required. If you say you implement that protocol, you must implement all of the protocol. You can't just pick and choose. However, in Objective-C, it had something called protocols. Okay, in Objective-C, things could be optional. So in Objective-C, uh, you could put the word optional in front of, so you could say like optional func, whatever, and it would mean that in this protocol, you can still say you implement this protocol and you don't have to implement this one. It's optional, okay? That was Objective-C only. Now, I, iOS used Objective-C, it was written in Objective-C, and it uses this optional protocol stuff a lot, okay? And I'm going to talk about how it uses it in a moment here. And so Swift has to have this mechanism. And so the way it does this is it lets you declare protocols to be at sign OBJC compliant. You just say at sign OBJC space protocol, whatever. And that means this protocol is an OB, OBJC compliant one. And inside that kind of protocol, you can use the word optional in front of any of the funks or vars in there to say this is optional so that someone who implements that protocol does not have to implement those optional things. Okay? This is used in iOS for something called delegation. I'm going to talk all about that. 
One thing that's interesting is that any optional protocol implementing class, so if you have a class and it implements a protocol, an Objective-C protocol with these optional things must inherit from NS objects. This is the second time that I'm telling you sometimes uh, a class can't, a Swift class can't inherit from nothing. It has to inherit from NS object or from a class that inherits from NS object, okay? Um, so, because it's all part of this Objective-C runtime and that class has to be available in the Objective-C runtime just the, like the protocol has to be available in the Objective-C runtime. Okay? So that's the optional thing there. All right, so here's what the syntax looks like. Here I'm declaring a protocol, it's called some protocol, okay? See, it has, just looks just like doing a class, right? Class, some class, enum, some enum, protocol, some property, exactly the same. And then there's the curly braces, and then there's these methods inside. Notice that you can have inheritance, in fact, multiple inheritance for protocols, all right? Now, Swift is a single inheritance model for classes, but for protocols, it's multiple inheritance. What does it mean for a protocol to inherit from another protocol? Well, it just means that some property, okay, some protocol, anyone who implements some protocol also has to implement all of these protocols as well. Inherited protocol one, inherited protocol two, it's got to implement those as well. So it's required, the requirement goes all the way through. Okay, that's what multiple inheritance means there. Okay, inside here, when you have a var, okay, remember this has to be, uh, in here, you have to specify whether it's a get only or get and set. You can do that with this little curly brace syntax here. You can either have the word get in here or get space set. There's no such thing as a set only property, okay? Get or get and set. Um, any functions that are mutating, that will mutate this thing, they're expected to mutate it, have to be marked mutating. And this is because structs can be allowed to implement these protocols. And we know that structs that have methods that mutate themselves have to be declared mutating. So you have to do the same thing in the protocol here as well. Um, now, it is possible to restrict your protocol, by the way, to be only for classes. In other words, enums and structs are not allowed to implement it. You do that by putting colon class comma right after the protocol. Before all the inherited ones, you just put class comma. Okay? That means this protocol is only for classes. Then you would not need mutating, okay, because we don't use mutating for classes. Um, you can even specify initializers in your protocol. And that's basically saying anyone who implements this protocol has to have an initializer that looks like this. Right? Okay, now um, you have this protocol declared with all the vars and, and funks in there. How do you implement it? Okay, well, a class or a struct or an enum comes along and it says at the end of its, after, in a class's case, after it says what its superclass is, it puts a comma and says, here's all the protocols I implement. And when it says these other protocols over here, it's promising to implement them. And the compiler will not let it get away with not implementing them. It will complain. Okay? So simple as that. Uh, if you have an enum or a struct, like here's an enum, there's no superclass, obviously, but otherwise it looks the same. Right? So this enum is saying, I'm going to implement these two protocols. Same thing with this struct. It's saying, I'm going to implement these. And obviously, if there are any mutating ones in here, it's going to have to say mutating in there. Okay? There's no limit to the number of protocols that a class or struct or enum can, uh, can implement. You can do as many as they want. Uh, if you have a init as part of the protocol and a class is implementing it, it has to make that init required. Okay, that's because you wouldn't want this class to have a subclass that doesn't implement this. Now it would not implement the protocol anymore, and yet it inherits the fact that it has to implement the protocol. So this, you need, that's why you have to have this be required. Okay? Uh, you are allowed to add protocol conformance via an extension. So you could have extension to something. Let's say this is a struct or a class or an enum colon, some protocol, and then put the methods in here. So now I'm extending that class or struct or enum to implement this protocol. And that just allows you to put this code off in another file. For example, you don't have to put it in the same file. Or you might be, uh, this might be a class you don't have the source code for. Maybe this is a UI kit thing. Maybe you're extending UI button to implement some protocol. You can do that with an extension, you see? And that saves you having to, for example, subclass UI button to add protocol conformance, just use an extension. 
Okay, it's all really very well thought out. They did a really good job with Swift with protocols and extensions. Protocols are a really important part of sophisticated Swift programming. If you're really going to build powerful, complex things, you really have to be facile with protocols. Because protocols really get at the heart of what the API contract is between things. Okay, it's really talking about these are the methods and functions I expect you to implement if you're going to work with me. Okay, that's what a protocol is all about. And that's fundamentally good object-oriented programming, fundamentally good encapsulation. So you really want to understand this. Now, this is a beginning starting class in iOS, so I don't expect you to have mastered this by the end. But again, it's something you've got to know that if you go out in the real world and start programming, people are going to expect, if you're going to be a sophisticated programmer, it's like you're going to know how to use protocols and not just make everything a class. Okay, all the courses you've had before now probably, everything's a class. Okay, it's a Java thing, everything's a class. Now, in the real world out there, you're probably gonna have a lot of protocols. Okay, question. Um, in what case would you use a protocol rather than an extension? Okay, so the question is, in what cases would you use a protocol versus just an extension, for example? And that's a good question. You would use a protocol anywhere you need to uh, specify that as a type in some API, right? If you need to say the, the argument to this method takes something that implements certain methods, then you need that protocol type to say that in your, in your, use it as a type. An extension, it's not its own type, it's just adding methods to an existing type. See the difference? So a protocol is a typing, it's for, for strongly typing things. Okay, so let's show, look at an example of protocols here. I have a protocol called movable, okay? It has a mutating function called move to a certain point, okay? That's its only method, and I have two classes, two, not classes, two data types here. A car, it's a movable, see, it implements move to, doesn't have to say mutating because it's a class. And I have a shape, like a shape on screen, a triangle or a rectangle, okay? It's movable, okay? And it mutes, it's mutating, okay? And it's got, they've each got other methods, like a car knows how to change the oil of a car, and a shape knows how to draw the shape, okay? But they share the fact that they're both movable. So I can create a couple local variables here, a Prius, which is a car, initialize it to a car here, and let's say I have a square, which is a shape, probably this would be actually square, open parentheses, close parentheses, probably have a subclass or a, a different kind of, well, let's say it's a shape, <laughs> okay. Um, so I got a shape here. Both of these, okay, the Prius and the square, are each a local variable of their of respective type. Now. I, and, and so these, this is the method that's common to them all. Now, I can create a var called thing to move, which is of type movable. That's its type, okay? And I told you protocols could be type. And look, I can set this thing to move to a Prius, because a Prius is a movable, because it's a car, you see? So this is perfectly legal right here. And I could even say thing to move, move to, and it'll call the cars version of move to. Okay, make sense? However, I cannot say thing to move, change oil. Okay, why not? Prius is a car, car can change oil. How come I can't say thing to move, change the oil? Because thing to move is not a car, it's a movable. Okay, movables only know how to move. Now the fact that underlying there's an actual thing, a car in there that can do change oil, that, that has, it's irrelevant, okay? It has nothing to do with it because this thing is typed to only be a movable, so you can only send movable things to it, okay? I could also say thing to move, this same variable, equals square, also perfectly legal because a square is a shape, a shape is a movable, okay? Um, I could even create an array of things to move that are movables, and put the Prius and the square in there. Okay, so even though a Prius and a square are completely different things, a car and a shape, okay, they can live in this array because they're both movables. This is an array of movables, okay? Now, I could have a function here, for example, called slide, which takes a slider, a thing to slide, basically, and it's a movable. So the argument type here of this function is movable. And inside here, I could say slider move to some position. And I don't care whether this is a car or a shape, this function slide has no idea whether it's sliding a car or sliding a shape. No idea. Because all it knows is it's working on a movable. So that's how you can use a movable as a type to an argument of a function. Okay? And see, I can say slide pre, slide square. It works perfectly. Yeah. So if you said car, um, class car equal to movable and some other protocol, car could be seen as a movable 
immutable object as well as the other protocol. Yeah, so the question is, I think the question is, if car was part of other protocols, yeah. then could I set some variable that's of that other protocol equal to this? Absolutely I could. Because it is both a movable and that other thing. Independently, it is both of those things. And I can even have a protocol right here that's two different things. Now, this would mean that for something to be passed to slip and slide through this variable, it would have to implement both of these protocols. So it's almost like I'm inventing a protocol in a slot with this syntax right here. It's almost like you're inventing a protocol that inherits both of these. Okay? So this means it requires both. That's what this protocol angle bracket means. Okay? And this could be any number of protocols in here. Now, I can't say slip and slide Prius here because a Prius is not slippery. It's movable. But it's not slippery, so it will not pass through here. Everybody got that? So that's protocols. Super powerful. You'll start to get a feel for them as we start using them more and more. Now, the first important use of protocol we're going to talk about is delegation. All right? So delegation is how we do this blind structured communication between our view and our controller right there. And we talked about this in the very second lecture, I think. Uh, about how sometimes our view wants to send message like, should I do this, or I will do this, I, like I'm a scroll view, I did scroll to this location, I will zoom to this zoom factor. Or if I'm a, some data thing like a table, I'm going to say, well, I've got a count of 400 rows, I want the data at row 7, I want the data at row 12 through 20. Okay? These kind of communications right here, you can see now with protocols, it's really easy. You just create a protocol that has all these methods in it. And anybody can implement this. Even though it's usually a controller, it doesn't have to be a controller. The controller, for example, could instantiate some other object that implements those methods. Okay? It would still be part of the controller camp, by the way. But it doesn't have to actually be a UI view controller subclass anymore. Okay? So let's see what that looks like. Um, first, some view, something in the view, okay, this generic, remember views are generic minions okay, of the controller. They declare some protocol, which is the methods, like the will, should, did, or the data at count, those things that it wants somebody else, like the controller, to implement for it. So it declares a protocol with all those methods and properties in it. Then the view's API, okay, somewhere in the view, it has a public property, okay, which is weak delegate, and the type is this protocol it invented. Okay, so this is going to be a var. Okay, that's going to have to be an object that implements that protocol. And it's weak because the view is kind of saying, well, if no one can do this will, do, did, should, or it can't do the count, add data, well, I'm just, I'll just sit here empty, or I won't do what I do, or I won't notify anyone of the wills and, and dids. Okay, I won't ask anyone the shoulds. So it can be nil. So that's why the delegate is usually weak. Okay? Or might even be unowned. Uh, but it's certainly not strong. Because you don't want the view to keep the controller in memory. Right, the controller keeps the view in memory, but you don't want the view keeping the controller in memory. All right, then the view uses this delegate property anytime it wants to send that sh will, should, did, count, data at. It just sends it to this delegate, okay? Because it knows the delegate implements those protocol methods. Then the controller has to declare that it implements this protocol, so it just puts it on its, you know, class U something UI view controller comma that protocol, and then the controller sets itself as this delegate. So it sets itself as this property. So now when the view talks to that delegate, it's talking back to the controller. So that's how it plays out to use delegation here, okay? Now, of course, the controller has to implement the protocol, has to implement the methods. But remember, this is all Objective-C world, right? This, the delegation is from the Objective-C world. So all these things you're going to see in iOS, these delegate protocols, like scroll views delegate and table views delegate, almost all the methods are optional. Okay? There's a few in there that aren't. And that's because you might not care that the scroll view just finished scrolling to this location. So you don't want to get that method, scroll view did scroll to point. You don't want it. So you don't even have to implement it. Okay, so these protocols are all going to be Objective C protocols, at sign OBJC, and they're going to have a lot of word optional in front of a lot of the funks. Okay. All right, so now the view is hooked up to the controller. The view still has no idea what kind of object is doing is implementing the will, should, and did. It could be anything. Any, it could doesn't even have to be a class. It could be a struct or something. Although actually, probably does have to be a class because this OBJC thing. Those have to be classes, NS object things. So it is a class, but it doesn't know that it's a UI view controller. It doesn't have to be a view control, UI view controller. So it's blind. 
but it's structured because the protocol says exactly the methods that have to be sent. All right. Um, so this, I keep talking about this happening because of Objective-C and the history of iOS. What would you do in Swift? Because Swift doesn't have these optional protocols. Well, in Swift, either you could do the same thing, okay, and just break up your protocol into the pieces that make sense. So you might have three or four different protocols and you'll only implement the ones that you want. Like you have the scroll view notification protocols and then you have the scroll view should protocols and then you have the data at protocols or whatever. Another way to do things like this is with closures, okay? You don't even need all this overhead of having these protocols do that. You can just have a closure, and the closure knows what the arguments to the closure are and what it's supposed to return, and that's essentially like having the protocol defined. So in this case, what you could do is you can imagine saying to the scroll view, when, I, when you're finished scrolling, send me this, or execute this closure, right? And you give it a closure. So that's another way to do it is with closures. And you're going to see that iOS is does some things with closures and some things with delegates. And they're not exact substitutes for each other. Protocols are sometimes nice because it makes it really clear what this object is capable of delegating. So that's nice. Closures are really good for things like error callbacks and multi, when a multi-threaded world when things are going to take a long time and they're done later and it wants to tell you it's done, that kind of thing. So we'll see both as the rest of the quarter goes on. All right, so here's an example of scroll view, right? So scroll view uh, that is a UI view subclass. It has a var called delegate. It's weak. Its type is UI scroll view delegate optional because you don't have to set a delegate here. Okay, the delegate protocol looks like this. It's an OBJC protocol, okay? And it has all these optional functions. It has over a dozen of them. Things like scroll view did scroll, uh, view for zooming and scroll view, which gets a view to zoom on, on inside the scroll view, et cetera. Okay, so a controller that wants to work with the scroll view will say, my view controller is a subclass of UI view controller, and it implements this protocol. Okay, now most of this is optional, so it doesn't have to do much to do that. Okay, and as you did load, this UI view controller is going to say scroll view dot delegate. This is some outlet that points to the scroll view dot delegate equals self, and that's going to be okay because it says that it implements this protocol. Okay, now the scroll view is going to use this to talk to this view controller. Okay, and then view controller implements whichever of these it wants and uh, <laughs> off to the races. Okay, make sense? All right, let's go through and talk about scroll view in more detail because this is an important class. All right, so here's an interesting, this is like iPhone 1 or something. You notice this is a very small little iPhone. But it has a cool little animation here to show you how scroll views work. Look at this scroll view. See, it can scroll view horizontally, and inside there can be vertical things. So this is a scroll view with inside, that's inside another scroll view. See that? So scroll view is really smart about that. Look at this one. Okay, you got two things. The top thing is scroll views, and the bottom thing is a horizontal scroll view with vertical ones inside. So you can see in the old iPhone 1 here, or whatever it is, uh, not a lot of screen space, but it's very efficiently being used by these scroll views. Okay, so scroll view is super powerful. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, scroll view works. And we do it mostly by adding subviews to it. Let's first remind ourselves what it's like to add a subview to a normal UI view. Okay, it's really simple. I've got a UI view right here in my phone. I just set the frame where I want this view I view right here to be added, and then I just add it. Okay, view, add subview. This is probably in a view controller, so this would be the top level view. And I'm just adding a subview. This specifies where it is. Right? Everybody cool with that? Very simple. So a scroll view is almost exactly the same. Okay? But the big step that's different is first we declare a content size. This is a big area. Okay, that the scroll view is going to be scrolling around in. Okay? And we specify by size. Okay? Here I've made one 3,000 wide by 2,000 high, so it's got a lot of room to scroll around in there. But once I've specified the content size, once I've set this var right here, now I just add subviews in the exact same way. Okay? Logo.frame, here I've moved it over to 2,700, so it's way over on the right. Scroll view, add subview logo. Okay? Just like any other view, I've added it as a subview. Could add another one. Let's add an aerial photo of Stanford here. Okay, added it as a subview. So they all get added in a coordinate system relative to this big content area right here. Okay, now the scroll view just moves around and lets you look around inside that content area. 
See? That's all it's doing is looking around. Now, you can move the subviews to different places in the same way you can move them in a regular view, right? So I could change the frame of the aerial view to be in the corner. I could change the frame of the logo maybe to overlap. I can also come along later and change the content size. Maybe I want this content size to be small enough to just fit my views, okay? And again, then when I'm kind of using my finger uh, in the scroll view, I'm just moving around in its content area. So the most important thing to understand about this is if you don't set your content size, you get nothing. You can't scroll because you're scrolling over that content size. This is the most commonly mistaken thing about scroll view people don't understand. They don't set their content size and so things can't scroll. Got to have a content size, okay? A um, couple of other interesting things. If you want to find out where you're currently showing in the content area, there's this uh, var inside of scroll view called content offset and it's just a CG point and it'll tell you the X and Y of the upper left corner of where the scroll view is showing, right? As it moves around, that changes. Also, if you wanted to know the whole, what this whole rectangle is in the coordinate system of one of these views, like this thing or the, or the, uh, the logo or the, or the aerial view, you can get the scroll view's bounds, okay? Scroll view bound, and use this UI view method convert rect from view. Okay, so you're going to convert this bounds from the scroll view's coordinate system to this aerial view. This is probably the UI image view, okay, to its coordinate system. Now you can find the whole rectangle in the, air, in the aerial guy coordinate system to show what's, what's visible. Okay? Okay, um, how do you create a scroll view? Just like in the other UI view, usually you're going to drag it out in uh, your storyboard, okay? Uh, you can also do embed in scroll view in the storyboard. Um, we don't usually do that very much, but you can. That's if you just had one view inside there, it would embed it uh, in there and also set its content size to the size of the thing you embedded. But usually we drag it out. Um, you can also create it in code, right? It's just a, it's just a uh, view, so you can use UI view frame uh, initializer there. Uh, then you uh, add your too big UI view, the view that's too big that you want to scroll over just by creating it and calling add sub view. Okay, we talked about it on the previous slides there. Okay, um, don't forget to set that content size. I can't emphasize that enough. If you don't, if you don't set the content size, it's just not going to work. Okay. All right. So you can scroll with your finger, but you can also scroll programmatically. And the classic way to do it is by saying scroll rect to visible, and you just specify a rectangle in the content size coordinate system, and it'll scroll to try and and show as much of that rectangle as possible. It'll scroll, scroll as little as possible to show as much as possible of the rectangle. Okay? Um, yeah, there's also a ton of other methods in scroll view. I can't talk about them all. You can go look at them up. Uh, but you can control which direction scrolling is allowed, just vertically or just horizontally. Or if it starts being vertical, does it lock vertical? That's how the scroll view inside scroll view works. Uh, things like that. You can flash your scroll bars, all kinds of stuff there. Okay? Now, what about zooming? So we've talked about kind of panning around. What if I want to zoom in, like pinch to zoom in? How do I do that? Okay, well, uh, all UI views, okay, have a property called transform. It's an affine transform, which means translate, scale, and rotate, or, or is incorporated into this transform. And so the scroll view, as you zoom, it's just modifying the scale of this transform property in the view. So basically, if you zoomed in really a lot, your view would get very grainy because all it's doing is basically scaling the bits up. Now, once it's finished zooming in, you could redraw your view to not be so grainy, okay, uh, if you have the ability to do that. Uh, but generally, when it's zooming, it is zooming the bits, okay, using this transform property. Um, zooming will not work unless you set these properties. Because by default, the minimum zoom scale and the maximum zoom scale is one, meaning no zoom, okay? So this is how much uh, you can zoom uh, size, so zoom down minimum. So 0.5 would mean it can zoom down to half its normal size. And this is zooming out, uh, you can zoom to twice its normal size if you set it to 2.0. Okay, so you have to set these, don't forget that, or your zooming won't work. You also won't work if you don't implement this delegate method. That's why I talked to you, told you about delegates. You have to implement this method, view for zooming and scroll view. Okay. By the way, notice these delegate methods. The first argument is always the thing that's sending you the delegate method. It's 
basically the sender. Okay, just so you know which, if you had two scroll views, you'd know which one is asking you for the view for zooming in scroll view. Now this is going to return the UI view that's going to have its transform modified when you pinch. Okay, so you have to implement this. If you don't implement this, you get no zooming. All right. Uh, you can also zoom programmatically, not just with the pinch, obviously. You can set the scale, or you can zoom to a rectangle that looks like this. So here I have a zoom scale of 1.2. I'm kind of zoomed out a little bit, and I could zoom back to normal. Okay, this is 1.0, so this is the normal size of this image. Or I could zoom back out to 1.2, so that's 20% larger, right? Uh, I can also do the zoom to rect. Let's say I had this little rectangle here, and I said zoom to this rect. It would show as much of the rectangle as possible. Or if I had the rect out there, and I said zoom to rect, it would zoom it down to fit that rectangle. Okay, so that's how you can zoom in from your code. Okay, there's lots and lots of other delegate methods. You can look at the documentation to figure out. A lot of them are the did and will. Uh, like here's did and zooming. This is where you might redraw your thing with more, uh, with a finer grain if you got scaled up really big and you got grainy, uh, things like that. So you can take a look at all those. Uh, I have a demo here at the end, but first I'm going to talk about what's coming up here. Uh, on Wednesday, your assignment three is due, of course, before lecture, you know that, and we're going to start talking about multi-threading. Right? Uh, Friday, the section is on UI testing, which is really cool in iOS. You can actually basically record mouse clicks and then play them back and make sure that you're getting the results you expect. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about table view and object-oriented database. I'm going to give a little break this weekend. Okay? I'm not going to assign assignment four on Wednesday. I'll be assigning it next Monday. It'll be due the Monday after, so you have no assignment over this coming weekend. Uh, there's no more reading assignments at all. Okay, right now I'm going to do a little scroll view demo okay, called Cassini. Any questions before I jump into that? Okay, Cassini. Okay, I'm going to create a brand new uh, thing here. So let's quit that. Let's go Oops, over here. Create a new project. Okay, it's going to be an IO. I'm going to start going fast through these new project creations here, single view application like we always do. I'm going to call it Cassini. Okay, all the things we normally do there. Put it in the same place we always do. Uh, here is our Cassini. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing where I'm going to move these uh, things out of the way, or at least most of them. Supporting, oops, supporting files. Okay, get out of there. I left info plist because we're actually going to look at that today. All right, here's my storyboard uh, for Cassini right here. Um, this storyboard has a generic view controller. You know, we always get this generic view controller. Now, in the calculator, we renamed this. Hopefully, you did that for your assignment. Uh, but I'm not going to rename it. I'm going to do another thing here because I don't want this to be a generic view controller. I want it to be a subclass of view controller, but I'm just going to delete this instead. So I'm going to take this view controller, and I'm going to right click and hit delete. Just get rid of that whole class and move it to the trash. Now, my storyboard, if I look at the identity inspector over here, it still thinks this is a view controller. Okay? So I need to create the actual class, not this generic view controller. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to create um, a iOS source, Cocoa Touch class. It's going to be a view controller. I'm going to call it image view controller. I'm going to have my UI here. What it's going to do is just display an image. Okay? So it's just, that's a very simple UI. It's going to display the image uh, in the whole uh, uh, screen of the phone or the iPad, whatever. Okay? So it's going to be an image view controller. It's going to display that. Uh, we'll put it in the same place we put all these other things over here. All right, here it is. Okay, you can see we have a couple of view controller life cycles here. here. I'm not going to be a bad citizen, so hopefully I won't have any memory that I'm going to leak. Uh, I'm also not going to navigate from this MVC, okay, on, on Wednesday. We'll be continuing this demo, and we'll be navigating to this, but not from it, so I don't need uh, the prepare for segue. That's only for things that are navigating from, okay? Uh, I do need my view did load right here, so I'm going to leave that in here. Uh, when I create a new MVC controller here, uh, you've got to remember to go back here to your identity inspector and set the class. If you don't, obviously none of your outlets are going to work right. You probably crash at launch, all kinds of things, okay? So I'm just using the identity inspector right here to set that to image view controller. Another thing I like to do when I create an MVC right off the bat is think about what is my model, 
okay? So this is an image view controller. What does it do? It shows an image. So I'm going to have its model, which is going to be public, and allow, I'm going to allow other people to set it, be the URL of the image to display, okay? So that's my model. It's a URL. Uh, it can be, could be a file in the local file system. could be something over the network, okay? So that's what, what it is. Now, to display this image URL's image, I need an image view. Now, we have created all of our classes, uh, all our views, by going over here and finding things, like there's image view down here somewhere. Here it is right here. And we've been dragging them out. And I could drag this out and all this stuff, but I want to start showing a little bit how to create views in code. So we're going to create this image view in our controller's code. And in fact, I'm just going to create a private var for it, which I'm going to call my image view. Okay, and I'm just going to set it equal to UI image view. So I'm creating one right here. I'm using the init that takes no arguments, so it's going to create an image view that whose frame is 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, tiny, tiny little image view. So I'm going to have to be careful to reset its frame whenever I put an image uh, in there. Okay, so now I have this image view. That's cool. Um, I mean, my view did load right down here. Okay, after. I'm loaded. I'm going to um, just take this uh, image view that I created and add it as a subview of my top level view. So I'm going to say view.add subview my image view. Okay, so remember this view right here, this var, okay, comes along with UI view controller. It's the view that's at the very top. Okay, so I'm just going to add this image view uh, in there. Now, its frame is 0, 0, 0, 0, so I'm putting it up in the corner there, okay? So right now it's not going to show anything, but I haven't put any image in there either, so nothing's going to happen. So I'm going to kill two birds with one stone and deal with that and create a new private var, which I'm going to call image. It's going to be a UI image, optional, okay? And this is going to be a computed var, okay? And in the set for this, this is when I'm going to set my image, okay? So this var, anytime I want to set the image that I'm showing, I'm going to set this var. And, every and I could also use it for getting, as you'll see in a second, but I'm just going to set it. So what do I need to do when I set an image? Okay, well, there's two things I need to do. One is I need to set the image view's image to that image, which is the new value, right? So now I'm taking my image view right here, and I'm giving it the image. But I know that I need to reset my frame, okay, to fit this new image. So I'm also going to say image view size to fit. Okay, so this is a method on image view that will size the image view to fit whatever image is in it. Okay, now the get is really easy. I'm just going to return the image view's image. So this is an interesting var right here. It's a computed var uh, that, it's a computed var. And it's actually storing its data somewhere else. It's storing it in the image view, but it's intervening when that value gets set to do this little size to fit. Okay, everyone understand why I have this image var? So now the rest of my code is going to look really cool. Anytime I want to set an image, I just say image equals whatever, and it's going to set it in the image view and size to fit it. Okay? Uh, now, what else do we need to do here? So we've got this nice image thing. Uh, one thing we want to do is whenever our model gets set, we want to go load that image up. So I'm going to do a did set here in my model. And I'm first I'm going to set whatever image I have to nil. So if I have an image that I'm showing, I'm going to clear that out. And now I'm going to go fetch the image that the person is asking me for. And in fact, I'm going to do that in another little method here, fetch image. Okay, it's going to be a little private func, fetch image, and all this thing is going to do is going to go out and look for this URL either on the internet or in a local file, okay? So how's it going to do that? Well, let's see if that URL is not nil, first of all, okay? So if I can let, oops, let the URL equal that image URL, okay? Now I know I have a real URL and I can go get it. So how do I get the data from a URL that corresponds to an image. Well, I actually use the class NSData. Remember I mentioned that class NSData that gets a bag of bits? It knows how to go out to a URL on the internet and get the bag of bits. So I'm going to say if I can let the image data equal the NSData's contents of URL, it's called, this URL. Now I have the image data. I just need to 
create a UI image out of that, and I'm good to go. So let's do that. I'm going to set my image equal to a UI image that is made with that image data. Okay, so this is an initializer for UI image, which takes the raw JPEG data, basically. So here I got the raw JPEG or ping or whatever it is data, and here I'm just creating a UI image out of it. And then I say image equals, which is going to cause this setter to happen, which is going to set the image in my image view and resize my image view to fit, right? <clears throat> and then we're good to go. Make sense? This code's pretty simple code, but I've intentionally broken it down into pieces like this to show you how you can use some of these Swift mechanisms to compartmentalize your code and make things kind of simpler. Like this is very simple to set the image because it's kind of taking some of the image handling stuff uh, out, of the, out of band there. Now we need an image to show. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show is a little demo image. So I actually have a little class right here with some demo URLs. Let's go take a look at this. It's actually just a struct with only static stuff in it. Okay, so I've got a little Stanford URL here to show some image of Stanford. I've also got some NASA images, which we're going to show uh, when we get to this demo on Wednesday. Okay, so I'm just going to go here to my view did load, all right, and I'm going to say um, that my image URL, that's my model, right, it's going to set my model here, equal to, um, I want to say it's equal to the demo URL.stanford. Okay, this is the demo URL Stanford that I have over here, demo URL dot Stanford. Unfortunately, this is a string, okay? URLs are actually classes, okay, in, uh, in iOS. So I have to use an NSURL constructor, which takes a string and turns it into a URL. Got it? Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Okay, didn't work. It's blank, and I have a little error down here. And this is a very interesting error, okay? You're gonna wanna pay attention here because it's gonna happen when you do your uh, homework next week. It says app transport security has blocked a resource load since it is insecure. By, de by default, only HTTPS secure HTTP calls are allowed to go through. If you want insecure calls like this, okay, that's just because my URL happens to be this kind, if you want that to go through, you have to put an entry in your info.p list. Okay, so this is what it li looks like to put something in your info.p list. You just click on info.p list so that it's showing here. Okay, and then you right click and say add row. Okay, when you add a row, you can see there's <laughs> dozens and dozens of different things you can control in your p list here. We actually want the third one down here, which is at app transport security settings. See that right there? So app transport security settings is a dictionary. So we click this to go down arrow, which means we want to edit what's in the dictionary. And we just hit plus, and it's going to add a key value here. So there's two different keys can be in that one. We want allow arbitrary loads. That allows us to load arbitrary URLs, okay? And we want to set it from no to yes, okay? So that means we want to allow arbitrary loads. So you're definitely going to need to do that. Uh, for your homework. So now we run, we'll go out there, there it is. Okay, it's a picture of Stanford. Now, the thing is, it's kind of good, but we can't see, we can only see the left half of the quad here, uh, and I can't scroll because, of course, we're not in a scroll view. All right, so how, we, how do we put this image view into a scroll view so that we can drag it around and look at the whole thing? Okay, now for this one, for adding a scroll view, I could do that in code as well, just like I did the image view. But to show you that it's not exclusive, which you do, I'm going to put the scroll view in the storyboard, and I'll put the image view in the code, and we can mix them. Okay? So how do I do that? I'm going to go to my storyboard right here. I'm going to go grab a scroll view out of here. I'm going to search for it, actually. Scroll. Here it is, a scroll view. So I'm going to drag it out and use the blue lines to put it in the edges here. that. Okay, I'm going to reset to suggested constraints. I'm going to go over here to my identity inspector, which I always like to do when I do that reset, and make sure 
Yep, trailing, leading, top, bottom, perfect. That's exactly what I want. I obviously need an outlet to this scroll view if I'm gonna talk to it and be it to delegate and things like that. So I'm going to get both of these on screen at the same time, my controller and my scroll view. Uh, let's go ahead and control drag here. This right here. I'm gonna call this outlet scroll view. Notice here's the weak strong, by the way, okay? If my scroll view leaves my view hierarchy, it can set me to nil, I'm fine. Connect, okay, we got our scroll view here. Now, all we need to do is set the image view as a sub view of our scroll view instead of as a sub view of our top level view. So really, all I need to do is change this to scroll view, okay? And it's gonna add as a sub view. Now, let's see, is this gonna work? Probably not, because I wouldn't ask that question. Why is this not gonna work, do you think? Oh, it looks like it worked, right? Let's scroll. Oh, it's not, why isn't this scrolling? What's going on? I put a scroll view in there. Is it, what's wrong with this thing, okay? Anyone have any idea why this is not scrolling? Bingo! If I had a can, if I was Mayron, I'd be throwing candy out to you. Uh, yeah, absolutely, no content size. So it's currently scrolling fine over a zero by zero area, okay? And the image is just bleeding out from the edges of it, okay? So we need to set the content size. Where do we set the content size? Well, one place we definitely need to set it is anytime we have an image because we want the content size to fit the whole image. So here I would just say scroll view dot content size, content size equals whatever uh, our image view's frame size is. Um, one thing I'm gonna do here that's kind of tricky is I'm gonna put a question mark right there. Why might I put a question mark there? Because this scroll view is an outlet. If this image setting happened, for example, when someone was preparing me, this would crash. Because my scroll view wouldn't be set in prepare. Now, no one, no one is yet segueing to me, but on Wednesday they're going to be. <laughs> so I have to be careful here. So here, if I haven't set up my scroll view and I get an image, I'm just gonna do nothing. Well, then I better do something when the scroll view gets set, okay? When the scroll view comes along later and gets set, I better do this content size. So I better do it in both places here. Okay, and here we don't need that. Okay, see why I'm doing it in both places? Because I'm not sure which is gonna happen first. Am my scroll view gonna get set first, or my outlet, you know, or is my uh, model, and thus my image gonna be set first? Okay? Okay, so now let's run, see if this works. All right, here it is, and sure enough, scroll beautifully, okay? And even if we rotate, and scroll. All right, so that's great, it's working wonderfully. On Wednesday, we'll talk about zooming, because we want to be able to zoom in on this. Then we're also going to talk a little bit about what happens if these images are huge and take a long time to download. That's hard for me to demo on this network, because this network is so fast. But I have some huge NASA images that I think will go slow enough that you're going to see. My UI is really sluggish as I wait for these uh, things to download. And that's why we'll use multi-threading, Wednesday's topic, to figure out how to make it all really, really, really snappy. OK, that's it. I'll see you then. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.